Welcome back to the Fourth Way Podcast. Today we are continuing our series on the Sermon on the Mount. As a reminder, the format is that I will be reading a sonnet I wrote as part of my children's compilation, and then expound on that poem and discuss. The tenth sonnet in this series is represented by the gem Garnet. It covers Matthew six nineteen through twenty three, and uh, which is about treasure in heaven, uh, two masters serving two masters, and the uh, lamp of the body. I have to say that out of all of the sonnets, this one kind of felt like the most forced, and is probably my least favorite. So this will probably end up being my my shortest episode. There might be some things that you can you can uh, draw from it if you go ahead and and read the the comments. Um, but hopefully you enjoy it anyway. Oh, and uh, one other thing to note, that Garnet was supposedly, um, I mean, one of the few things that I could find on it was that it was supposedly, according to tradition, the stone that Noah used to illuminate his ark while they were on the water. That will provide some important context for some of the the comments that I make, uh, some of the lines in the poem. Can eyes foresee what tattered lives bespeak? Can flesh give some of itself unto life? Or is our mind illumined by what's bleak, and beings marred and with corruption rife? We see Noah light his path with garnet, a decent man with his family saved. Yet what came out of the maritime pit was same broken humanity depraved. As an Adam, we all enter death's bark. So like him, through one man we'll all be saved. One who embarked on messianic ark defeated death with life inside the grave. The one came from heaven and treasured earth that those of earth could seek the kingdom first. So the first stanza in this poem is going to emphasize our inability to save. We are we are broken creatures and we are we are without hope to save ourselves. Corruption is uh, infused into our very being. It's it's who we are. The second stanza brings in Noah and his family and, and their situation and the story of their salvation um, through, through the ark. But even Noah and his family, even though it says uh, at the beginning of the story that, that God found Noah as a righteous man, uh, even Noah and his family, after exiting the ark, were just as depraved as they were when they entered. They brought uh, sin on the ark with them, apparently, because when they left, sin sin was right there. Um, and, and even in this one man and his family's salvation, uh, you know, you think, okay, I've got this hope. The world was just destroyed and evil was, was conquered. But then they step off the boat, and very quickly the story devolves, and you realize, no, sin has not been conquered. It's still there. It's still infused into humanity. And just a little side note, I thought this was interesting, it's not really super pertinent to the poem, but um, you know, it does talk about uh, that uh, Ham, I think it was, uh, uncovered his father's nakedness. That was kind of the, the Noah Noah passed out drunk, I guess, um, or something, uh, and, and then Ham went and uncovered his father's nakedness. There's a really interesting episode or question answer, I don't know, Michael Heiser talks about that phrase, and we see it elsewhere, well, I think like one other place, or, or maybe it's not even in the Bible, maybe it's just in other Jewish literature, but this this uncovering your father's nakedness is a euphemism for um, basically having sexual relations with your mother. So, you know, I had always envisioned that that Ham goes, and uh, his, his dad passed out drunk, and he takes his his robe off of him and that that didn't really seem like that big of a deal to me i mean as far as like the curse that ensues from that um and and maybe that literally did happen but it might also be a double entendre or it might might really just be this euphemism for for this other act um so if it was that bad if it was that big of a thing then man, that was that, that's very clearly uh, this this sin and depravity that stepped off the boat with with Noah and his family. However, 
In the third paragraph, we see that in Adam, um, we are all in the same boat. So it's we can't look back at Noah and, and all of these other people uh, and all of our ancestors and say, man, they were they were messed up people. Because through Adam, we are in the same boat. And that sounds really bad, and, and we know that death and sin are, are a bad boat to be in, but there is hope for us. Now this is where I'll probably depart from a lot of the people who would listen to this in that um, being reformed, uh, I, I would adhere to original sin and federal headship, which which basically means that um, you know in Adam we are all in Adam when he sinned, and it it, it really sounds like a, such an unfair thing that uh, because Adam sinned that I sin too, but I think there are a couple a couple ways you can look at it, and I think the first thing is. If I would be put in Adam's shoes, I would have sinned too. So it's not like this this unfair, oh, well, if I would have had my chance, I would have done it differently. I don't think that's the case. I think Adam is representative of, not just representative of, of us uh, in terms of uh, we have the guilt of Adam, but he's also representative of us in the sense that he did exactly what we would do too. So that's fair. But uh, the second thing is, th- and I only realized this a few years ago, but one of the beauties of federal headship uh, and Adam representing us is that if representation, if if standing in somebody else's place for sin doesn't work, how would it work for redemption? Um, it seems like federal headship, uh, while it sounds really bad for uh, inheriting sin or sin guilt, it's it's glorious in terms of our redemption because Jesus was able to stand in our place. And nobody ever looks at, at that side of it. They don't say, well, if we all would have sinned anyway and there's no such thing as federal headship and nobody can stand in our place... That's a problem. So basically, without that, we'd all be damned. And that is a a very big problem. Of course, there are lots of other theological terms and ideas and and theories that you could go into. Uh, It's a lot more complicated than just that, but it's kind of a simple way for, for looking at it and maybe recognizing that even if you disagree with federal headship, um... It's, it's not as bleak and depressing and uh, overbearing as it might sound because for, for all of that despair that it might give you on the sin side of things, it's also what comes back and gives you the hope and the beauty on the redemptive side of things. So even though we're in the same boat as Adam, because of federal headship, we are able to be hauled into a new boat through a different saving representative the new Adam, which is Jesus Christ. Jesus pulled us into his boat, his uh, his bark, um, which is another name for boat, and in Romanian, barca is a name for boat. Um, But I use it as a double entendre there, so bark meaning boat, but also the way that Christ did this was through the bark of a tree. Right? Jesus hung on a tree, so bark is supposed to um, kind of be a, a double entendre to allude to the cross through the means whereby he pulled us into his boat. So the life that Jesus lived had a an arc of perfection, moral perfection. Uh, it was the story. Uh, the story arc was uh, perfect. It was beautiful. Um, and through that story arc, through through that moral arc of perfection, uh, w- he also becomes our arc of salvation, as I think it's Peter. Peter references uh, the arc. So Jesus Christ, whose treasure and life is in heaven, lowered himself so that our treasure could be there too. And that is a, a beautiful depiction, a beautiful story arc running from Genesis through Revelation. Hopefully you enjoyed that.
And uh, that's all for now. So peace. And because I'm a pacifist, when I say it, I mean it.